Croeso yr hyd yn ymlaen o FCTV, lle roedden nhw'n ffocws yn benodol ar faith. Gyda costau mewn bynnau yn ychel iawn ar hyn o bryd, mae'n bwysig i bod ni'n edrych yn fanwl iawn ar gostau a sydd da ni'n bwyta yn anifiliaid. Yn yr rhaglen hon, byddwn ni'n ymuno hefo Kate Phillips sy'n mynd i fod yn sôn am borthiant mamogaeth cyn wyna. Ond yn gyntaf, awn draw i weld sut mae'n gwneud y defnydd gorau o gnwd ffodr byd. Mae gan ffodr byd potensial mawr fel cnwd brasig ha. Hwn sydd hefo'r yield mwyaf yn hermau bwl ca gegni, ond mae nifer y sianlun sy'n ei gwynebu wrth ei dyfu a'i ddefnyddio'n effeithiol. Rydym yma heddiw yn tŷ draw yn trefynion gyda'r ffermwr Matt Roberts sydd wedi bod yn tyfu ffodr byd ys rhai blynyddoedd bellach. So, um, what attracted you to grow fodder beets in the first instance as a crop? After going to an open day three or four years ago, we saw the potential for growing fodder beets. So uh, we want to lessen our wintering costs and reliance on putting sheep out on grazing. But also, uh, when the sheep go out after lambing, it cuts our concentrate costs down dramatically. And we also put it into the cattle diet, which saves us a it brought our feed costs down a lot as well. And how do you maximise the utilisation of this crop? Um, by feeding it to the cattle to fatten those cattle and for growing them and for the sheep and lambs as well for when they go out after lambing so the ewe still milk and get enough off that fodder beet so we don't have to rely on a concentrate so we can balance that fodder beet with good grass then. So Jim, what's the nutritional value of the leaves and the bulb? So in this crop the bulb is largely the energy contribution in sugar and the leaf contributes nearly all of the protein and a lot of the minerals, calcium and phosphorus in particular. So in a well-grown crop like the one we have behind us here, on a dry matter basis, that leaf will be about 20 or 25% of the total dry matter of the plant. So when we roll that all together, the energy value of beet when it's grazed in the paddock like this is almost always exactly 12, and the crude protein content of a well-grown crop like this will be somewhere between 11 and 13% crude protein. Is there any danger in feeding the tops in terms of toxicity and so on? No, none at all. Um, there was an old urban myth that's persisted for many years that the tops were poisonous because they contained oxalic acid. And like a lot of those urban myths, there's a grain of truth in it. They do contain a little bit, but it's not toxic at all for stock. And stock can eat a lot of that leaf. In fact, they can have it as 90% of their intake without any difficulty at all. So there's no genuine difficulties with the leaf ever. The bulb, however, has a lot of sugar in it and it does take a period to adapt the stock to that. And if you don't adapt them uh, carefully, sometimes they can have rumen acidosis. So that sugar in itself isn't a toxin, but there is a process of avoiding animal health issues by adapting them to it. Are there any special techniques in terms of grazing and utilising the fodder beets, um, especially with transitioning stock onto it and so on? Yes. That transition is a really important part of um, achieving performance on the crop. Firstly, uh, rumen acidosis is an issue if the stock are put onto it too fast. And secondly, stock can be taught not to eat the crop if they're uh, exposed to more of that crop than they should be in the early stages. So there's a very set process of transition. So we start them on a small amount and we gradually build them up to their full intakes over about two weeks. So what it looks like for adult cattle, so 440 kilos and above, we would normally start them on about two kilograms of dry matter on the first day. And then once they were eating that, and once we were confident that the whole group was eating that, then we'd increase them by one kilogram of dry matter every second day. That takes about two weeks to achieve their maximum intakes. For the most uh, effective use of beet, both for young stock and for adult stock, there's a certain proportion of their diet that should be supplied as either silage or hay uh, or straw for older animals to go with their full intakes of beet. That's approximately 10% of their diet. In real terms for young stock that works out at about one kilogram of dry matter with as much beet as they could eat and for adult stock including dairy cows that works out about two kilos of dry matter with as much beet as they can eat. There's a sweet spot with roughage. If they have too much roughage, they then replace the beet that they would have eaten with that extra roughage because it's easy for them to eat that roughage. If there's too little roughage, they slow down their own intake of beet and they reduce it. So the sweet spot for maximum intake and maximum production is two kilos for adults and one kilo for young stock.
For young stock in particular, they'll always achieve best performance if they're fully supplied with the trace elements that they need. Trace element deficiencies are usually a regional things, so sometimes areas will have soils that are deficient in different trace elements. It sometimes might be copper, might be selenium, and in certain instances, and this is particularly true in parts of the United Kingdom, that copper in particular could be locked up by some soils having either very high molybdenum or really high iron. So we're quite careful with young stock going on that they're supplemented before they do with their full requirements in trace element, but that will vary from region to region. In most cases that can't be given in the water as it often would in other circumstances. Because this is a really high water content crop, they typically won't drink anything at all when they're on full intakes with this. So supplying it in the water is not an effective way to do it. So it's often given directly as an injection or sometimes as copper capsules or bullets that are put down into the rumen in young stock. And in New Zealand that's uh, almost universal. With older animals that requirement is not as strong, but they still have to have uh, trace element supplementation if they're on there for longer periods. And by that typically we mean more than about 70 days. So again, that local regional advice is required. In terms of animal performance and growing cattle um, specifically, what, uh, what sort of lightweight gains would we expect? So we have uh, a lot of data on this and long experience in New Zealand with both young stock, so weaners starting somewhere between 250 and 300 kilos uh, live weight, and with the older stock, uh, both dairy cows, but also in beef animals above 400 kilos, uh, in uh, or typically steers 440 and heifers at 400. The, the typical live weights that are achieved on well-managed crops and well-managed systems with the young stock over a 150 day period from autumn to mid, to mid uh, spring is usually about a kilo a day. And for the older stock, that's normally about 1.3 to 1.5 kilograms a day. So it's a very strong performance. It's a very high dietary energy in the crop and it's got an adequate crude protein. It's very palatable, so it pushes their intakes. As a consequence, we get very good live weight performance. So is grazing um, dry dairy cows an option? In fact, that was the first stock class that we perfected the use of fodder beet on in New Zealand. Um, the whole country is uh, spring calving and winter dry, and so it's very common in New Zealand to have dry cows on a 60 or sometimes even a 100 day winter. When they're introduced to beet, they're transitioned onto it, and then it's the majority of their diet. They'd be fed that beet as much as they could eat, with a, as we said before, with a small amount of roughage that would go with it. So it's a very effective way of putting body condition score on dairy cattle over that dry period. So Jim, what are the key considerations for using fodder beets when you are um, grazing for sheep, grazing with sheep? The most important component of that system when sheep grazing is being undertaken is to make sure that you have a good crop with lots of leaf. In many cases, sheep are grazed on the crop without any other roughage supplement, and therefore that constitutes almost all of their diet. So it's really important that you've got uh, agronomy that produces a good leaf and a solid leaf that stays into that colder autumn and winter period. If you don't, then you're liable to run into problems with the total concentration of protein in the diet. and That will normally have an effect on their intake and therefore their performance and in some cases can lead to animal health issues. So the first thing is if it's a well-grown crop and it's got 20 or 25 percent of the leaf as a dry matter, that will normally be a crude protein that'll suit even multiples uh, for in-lamb uh, use. The other consideration is that uh, sheep won't eat much of this crop into the ground so the choice of the cultivar to make sure it's a cultivar that stays out of the ground becomes more important. And then the final one is that the allocation for sheep by the farmer has to be quite careful. It's much easier in cattle because you can judge it by how much you've left behind. In sheep because they don't eat it quite the same they have to normally be allocated really carefully. In most instances on the crops that the UK experiences, that'll be a minimum of about a metre and a half per animal per day. It's a straightforward process and they're fed behind a wire, but it is a little different to cattle. So Jim, do you think there's more scope for Welsh farmers to be out wintering on fodder beet? Yes, I do. Uh, I think there's two parts to that um, answer. Number one, it's a cultural issue. Uh, people are used to sheds, they often still have the sheds and that's what they've done for many generations. But there's more and more cost pressures that are coming on farming. And one thing that can't be avoided is the fact that sheds are much more expensive than outwintering. 
I think the second part of it is that the New Zealand experience has demonstrated that even in quite wet environments, outwintering can be done and be done very well. People sometimes think that New Zealand is a dry environment, it's not. And particularly our winters in the southern part are very wet indeed. And I don't think that they're any less wet than uh, the uh, Welsh environment. So my feeling is that there's a great scope here for outwintering and it would be a very effective way to reduce costs. So, Mac, what are the site considerations and limitations for growing for the beet as a crop? Yeah, because um, the, the crop's a root crop, we're really looking at um, a more of a drier site. So we're looking for a free draining soil, ideally, and then ideally, again, in a low rainfall area. Uh, if your rainfall's too heavy, uh, it's quite often lifted or grazed during the winter time. So it's a no-go, really. So looking yeah. at those lighter soils on the whole. So what is the growing cost for, for the beets um, in 2022 in terms of seed costs, spraying costs, fertilisers and so on? Yeah, so, so overall we're probably looking at about £1,300-£1,400 per hectare, uh, plus then we've got rent added on if you're going to put that. But uh, we're probably talking around 8 pence per kilo of dry matter if it's grazed in situ, and we're talking about 10 pence per kilo of dry matter uh, if it's lifted. Uh, and I suppose the best way of putting that is if it's compared to silage, silage would be at about 20 pence per kilo at the moment and then concentrates nearer 40 pence. So it's much lower down uh, that cost base. And again, grass is at a similar cost around that eight pence. So it's very similar to grass. How much does it cost in terms of grazing for beef, sheep, uh, beef and sheep? Yeah, well, uh, I suppose in, in terms of cost per day, we're probably talking uh, anywhere from 70 pence to a pound per day uh, for cattle depending on the on the size of them um, and then really for sheep we're probably talking 15 16 pence per day something along those lines I suppose with the cattle we're really comparing it to housing throughout that winter period and it's a doubling of that cost if they're housed so if it costs me a hundred pound to take them through the winter uh, it's 200 pound if they were housed so that's really where the big saving comes in in terms of stocking rates, what would you recommend, Mac, um, for sheep and cattle? Yeah, so for sheep, we're probably looking at a 100 sheep per hectare, and that would last for about 100 days on the crop. Uh, for cattle, we're probably looking around 15 to 20 cattle, depending on the size of them. And then we're talking probably up to 150 days at that rate, depending on the size. So, you know, it's such a high yielding crop that we can really stock that field. I suppose the one thing we may have to consider if we're in a wetter area, we might be better off planting half the field in grass and half on fodder beet and, and strip grazing it because there'd be more mud uh, with that system. So that grass break is quite useful sometimes. Mae penderfynu ar y lefel a'r math o ddwysfwyd i fwydo i famogaeth cyn y rhedeg wyna yn bwysig iawn a mae hyn yn mynd i gyfrannu tuag at llwyddiant yn ystod y cyfnod wyna. Yn ddiweddar, bu am draw at Kate Phillips yr arbenigwraig a defaid annibynol sydd yn sôn am y ffactorau pwysig sy'n eisiau negofiau wrth fwydo defaid cyn y ddynod a wyn. I really very much encourage all farmers to get their forage analysed. I'm often asked to do a ration for a farmer, um, but if I haven't got some figures to base it on, then I've nothing to go on and it's guesswork and really not worthwhile. So I really do encourage farmers to get an analysis done um, and then we really do find out the dry matter, how wet it is, um, the digestibility, the level of protein. All of these things are critical in terms of how much supplement we're going to need and which supplement we're going to need. We have a huge variation. Let's say the very best silages we're seeing are about 11.5 mE, megajoules per kilogram dry matter, and some of the lower end ones are around about 9. So we know we're going to need a very different level of supplement according to the energy and digestibility of that feedstuff. So really important we have that. Um, and then a proper ration, a balanced ration can be delivered to the farmer. Now, in terms of which supplement to choose, um, we've got lots of products on the market, be they compound feeds um, based on a variety of uh, straight ingredients, um, things like cereals, um, rapeseed meal, soya bean meal, a lot of cereal byproducts that are human food byproducts quite often. Um, and a, a good way of looking at that is to look at the level of ingredients. There are in descending order of inclusion on every bag of feed a farmer will buy, there is a list of ingredients. And um, looking at those to see if you think, I understand that, I know what that is. 
So if you saw wheat, most, of, most farmers would think that's a good quality cereal that's included. But you might see something like um, uh, oat feed in there. Oat feed, you might also think, oh, that's okay, that's oats. But actually, oat feed is a really, really poor quality ingredient. And I don't want to see very much of that, if at all, in any compound feed. So we're looking at quality ingredients within the compound feeds. I mean, every compounder is making a range of feeds. They have one that they really want to sell, which is their mainstream product, but they would also produce a really top quality product and possibly a pretty basic um, commodity at the other end. Now, you get what you pay for, okay? So if you look at the range of prices, you often, buying the best quality product is usually the best value for money and usually you have to feed less of it. So you actually end up better off because your animals are getting less supplement. Balanced with the forage, we've got the analysis, we've got the um, value of the supplement in terms of the energy and the protein content. And we're getting um, probably a better deal for your sheep because we want to maximize forage intake and minimize the supplement, but minimize it, I don't mean give them nothing if they need it, we give them the right amount to balance their forage. So critically, looking at things like um, the protein, the oil, the fibre and the ash in a compound feed, that's a declaration on the label. So just roughly speaking, if we've got a compound with more than 10% ash or more than 10% fibre, then that is indicative to me of a low energy compound. So they're just a good rule of thumb for farmers to look at the label and think, hmm, if it's got a very high fibre and a very high ash, the energy is likely to be low. So you're looking at a poor end quality compound at the bottom end of the range, whereas you'd see ash levels, let's say 6 to 8% in a better quality compound and likewise with fibre as well, the same sort of levels. There's an awful lot about um, giving ewes proper access to their feeds and that means forage and concentrates. So in terms of forage, for an animal the rule of thumb we use for an animal to get truly ad-lib, and that's what we want, we don't want to be restricting forage intake at all. We want to be giving them all they need, and basically that means little and often, all day. Be that grazed grass, or be that forage, or hay or silage indoors. So we talk about trough space for uh, forage inside, be it for a TMR, or for ad-lib forage on a more typical conventional way of feeding use. We talk about 15 centimetres per ewe or six inches. Now that's you know, an average across all sizes of animals. So if we had a tiny ewe, a 50 kilo ewe without horns, they might need a little bit less than that. And a massive ewe, a 90 kilogram ewe, let's say, um, at the other end of the scale might need, need more. Um, and in terms of concentrates, if we're obviously if we're putting um, concentrates into a TMR mix, then there's same rules apply. We need that 15 centimetres a U. But if we're actually trough feeding concentrates at any point, we must give them about um, 18 inches per head or 45 centimetres per head, so they all get to the trough and get their share of the concentrates. The other thing to remember is if you're feeding very small amounts of concentrates. Um, you need more trough space to make sure everything gets in there quickly because the big greedy ewe will rush in and get three times the amount that she should have and the shy or young ewe gets their last, is a bit too nervous about getting to the trough and gets very little. So really important that you balance your groups, make sure you, maybe you're giving um, preferential treatment to your younger ewes that aren't particularly used to feeding concentrates and they haven't got to compete with the older ewes. So yeah, Remember, they're six inches or 18 inches, if we're in old, old terms, or, or 15 centimetres or 45 centimetres for forage versus concentrates. At the money, we did correct the weather here in the OFC TV. Also, we will put that in the draw, we will have a